All right, all right. We are broadcasting live now, and I want to welcome everybody. On today's show, we are going to be talking about a little bit of a different subject. We're going to be talking about improvisation. And um, let me move my mic so that we don't get so much popping. We're going to talk, that's part of improvisation, too, when you got some things happening. But we have to do it in our careers. We have to do it in jazz. We have to do it as musicians. We have to do it in life. So we're going to go ahead and hit you guys with um, a little bit of a different subject, improvisation and how it um, can help move you through your career to have a long career if you get good at improvisation. Or whether you're a musician or whether you're an engineer, you still got to do some jazz, baby. So uh, <laughs> this is Colleague Glover, and um, I'm the host here at the Hangout, and we, I'm joined by Dave Hampton and hey. Bill Kamek. And um, we we got Greg Fine as a guest here, and we've also got Mott uh, Hotep getting ready to come on, and other Pensado students and other uh, just different people coming on. If you think you might want to join us, come on and hang on out with us. This is just an informal hangout with us uh, kicking it about all things music. And I will switch it over and have everybody kind of say what's up to the people. What's up, you guys? All right. Short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey everybody. Everything's good. What's going on, Greg? How you doing, man? What's up, Bill? What happened to uh, the facial hair? He did a little shaving, I noticed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Huh? I, I, had, I had to do some socializing today, so I had to switch it up. I you know, see. You can't, you can't take good, pictures man. all the time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you got to switch it up so it looks a little recent and new. So You, yeah, you had to be true. believable so you cut off the facial hair, right? Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, man. Nice. Besides, you know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes you got to bring it down so, like, the younger chicks are like, oh, hey, how you doing? So it's like, you oh, got to. Okay. <laughs> you know, that that's called improvisation, brother. Improvisation. Improvisation. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to improv with the facial hair when you yeah, do social. Yeah. I need to take some notes, though. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, um, you know, I wanted to um talk about the similarity between, you know, improvisation in music and jazz especially and how it kind of compares to improvisation just in life in general and in our careers specifically you know cuz um Dave and I were talking about this subject just kind of off the cuff and uh, you know what I said you know that would be a great subject to talk about um, on one of these shows and then we were thinking back to our conversation we used to have a lot of late night conversations with um, Herbie Hancock and Marcus Miller and some of the other guys you know the jazz musicians especially that's kind of their mantra of being able to deal with that and um, you know Dave and I just started talking about different ways we had to do it we had to do improv even when we were at Paisley Park working for Prince you know Dave had to do some major improvisation <laughs> to make things happen mm -hmm. and um, you know he reminded me of a couple of things that I had to do coming up in in um, work when I was working at Lion's Share and on various sessions we've seen each other do and various artists we work with so I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions on things like that too and let y'all take it too because I'm sure you've had to do your own share of improv as well. Um, anybody, uh, anybody want to start and kick it off with a great improvisation story? Uh, I'll give you one real quick, and it's it's part part improvisation and part lesson. And one of the things, uh, and I and I've told this before, um, but in my in my twelve years with Herbie, a lot of what I had to do was just some. Whenever we did tours and we used electronics, we had to do things that were kind of like cutting edge. And so when we go into rehearsal, my thing was, okay, well, we're going to use laptops. Nobody was using laptops, and we're going to do whatever and do it in surround. And, and I had all these backup plans. And we started rehearsal one time and said, okay, well, we're using five new things. Among them was logic. They were like rewriting logic for us every other week <laughs> in order to be able to do some things. And... I kept this saying, okay, with the environment too. Right, with the environment. Yeah, so so this, so I'm going, okay, Herbie, we're going to start rehearsal. If this doesn't go, we're going to go to this, and, and, and this is plan B, this is plan C. So then he turns to me and he goes, hey, Dave, why don't you just plan on it working? Right. <laughs> so then, so, so at that point, I was like, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to ever come up short working for him. So my intensity was on being methodical and being 
the tech that I was, you always have a backup strategy. But I understood at that point he wanted my intensity without my commitment to failure. You understand what I'm saying? So for me, it was a big lesson that he wanted me to improvise, but his way of telling me was not to say, hey, Dave, why don't you improvise? It was just, hey, man, why don't you cut all that other stuff on, take a direct route, plan on it working, and everything else is going to be okay. And, and ever since then, I've never employed my my old self of always having a plan, always having a plan. I just go, if I'm there and I'm in that capacity, it's going <laughs> to function somehow. somehow. And I'm going to, you know, and I'm not trying to take, a, in early in my career, I would take a bunch of tools. I take, I take, you know, probably half of bands full of tools all to, to be able to have an answer right there and do it. And it's good. But after a while, you, you got to start to push yourself to, to, to just get better and, and be able to use your experience. Just like I was talking to Bill before we started on the call, and I said, man, how do you retain all the information on what works, what doesn't, and all these different modes? And, it, you know, that's part of improv improvising, too, is that you develop a strategy on, on just what to retain, what to throw away, yep. you know, and, and how you're going to access, you know, basically how you think. And, and, and it really helps, especially when you're dealing with content and music, just to be able to, to be able to do improvisation. on it. For me, it's on an engineering and a support level, just the same way I see the band doing it on a musical level, because it helps you get into the experience of bringing what they're doing to life when you're mixing front of house or mixing monitors or whatever. You know, so I, it was a valuable lesson for me just in how to how to place my energy, what to focus on, what was the primary thing, what was important, you know, and it was being in the moment and being 100% invested in the moment, not not invested in your backup plan, you know. That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing was, and he, he the plan on it working um, philosophy, too, because of his Buddhist philosophy, uh, philosophies on a lot of these things, is yeah. like, well, if you, if you, have a plan on it failing. That's most. Uh, that's Murphy's law and all that too. That's gonna, it's going to show up, you know. So if you just plan on it working, it doesn't matter what shows up. You're going to figure out a way to get through it. And that was a valuable thing. How many times was he ready to try the newest software? He'd come in mm -hmm. and he did us in the studio. Uh, have a brand new Pro Tool system uh, installed. Everything fresh, fresh code and everything. And then we got line or we got some kind of deadline we got to turn it in <laughs> and, and when we do that it was like you just have to make it work doesn't matter what comes at you and everything okay find another way and get it happening we got all these cats here or they, they're they yeah. expecting this to be delivered so that really is a it's a great th thought to have and a great way to operate rather than you and I Dave we used to always Dave and I I swear in our younger days, we probably were some really in shape niggas. <laughs> we were probably some really in shape dudes because, uh, you know, he used to help me carry all my gear and I used to help him carry all his gear. Dave had toolboxes, rack mounts, all kinds of stuff. I had so radio shack in my car. Oh, brother, yeah. I'm telling you, the whole store on every gig. So, you know, when we were just helping each other do things, it became yeah. amazing because... Um, you had every single contingency plan, but after mm -hmm. a while, most of that stuff just did not get used. And what we started finding is, you know what, I just don't feel like carrying that all today. And then when we got to the gig, nine times out of ten, we made it work with what we had. What we had to make happen, happen. You know, so that's why we've constantly been scaling down. You know, we got very scaled down systems now. I think uh, production-wise, we can hear from uh, Greg as far as uh, what he thinks about improvisation. Well, uh, as far as a guy like Herbie, I think that's part of the uh, jazz mentality to uh, be uh, willing to make mistakes and to feel confident that you can take a new direction in the moment. And uh, I think that's what uh, differentiates a lot between jazz musicians and um, of the musicians, especially classical musicians, is that the mistakes are kind of part of the music, and uh, you almost have a comfort in that uh, if you do make a mistake, you find another uh, avenue to go in. And actually, when I listen to uh, a lot of jazz music, it's kind of uh, part of what I enjoy about it, because I feel like the musician is really going for 
they're they're reaching for something, you know, and so the mistakes aren't a big deal. Yeah, um, yep. A story I was thinking of actually um, is a great bass player, uh, Charlie Hayden, who uh, I studied with when I went to Cal Arts, and um, he worked with the Ornette Coleman Quartet, and uh, those guys like revolutionized jazz. Uh, I guess kind of in the in the seventies, um, uh, with like free jazz, and uh, there was a. Um, uh, a class that we had that Charlie was teaching and uh, I remember um, all the students were playing a tune and uh, Charlie was playing bass you know with the group and uh, he always kind of played with his eyes closed and really you know focused and deep kind of just really listening to what was going on and uh, I was sitting near uh, one of the guitar players a student who was playing and as he's playing in his solo, um, something is happening with his cable uh, to his amplifier. There's all this like crackling going on or something, all this noise starts happening. So me and uh, one of my fellow students, we try to uh, you know, help him and figure out what's going on you know, technically with his, with his cable. Uh, but Charlie, instead of kind of looking around and uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, see what the problem is or stop stopping the band. Instead, he grabs his bow on the bass and starts making like whale noises, you know. <laughs> so he kind of like went with that mistake in the moment, you know, and made that part of the music and that was just like a revelation to see him do that. I um, love that, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. funny when, when you uh you know, I just thought of that anecdote right now, but uh that's kind of a, a lesson in itself almost, you know. Yeah. Hey, Greg, uh, real quick, before we go too much farther, I want you to give yourself a proper introduction. We introduced you by name and everything, but tell us all a little bit about yourself. We've got a lot of people watching and everything. I'm just now getting to meet you, and um, I would love to know more about, um, just give us some background about yourself. Would you mind? Um, well, my company is called Hidden Tiger Music, and nowadays I mostly produce music for... Um, Television. I do a lot of music for ads. Um, I've worked with most of the major brands out there, like Ford, Calvin Klein, Old Navy, Mercedes. Um, just about every <laughs> brand that you could think of, almost. Cool. And uh, done stuff for television, and radio, um, as well as a lot of album projects with different bands. And <clears throat> so I've explored a lot of different genres. Um, consider myself to be pretty eclectic, but uh, I came up uh, as a jazz musician, really, as a guitarist first, and uh, I guess since high school, um, I just loved jazz and improvisation, and um, I kind of just followed that path for a long time, all through my 20s, and I went on the road a lot and performed with different musicians. Um, Actually, I met Herbie in, uh, <laughs> I think, 2006. I was playing on another band. Uh, we did a concert in Spain, and uh, we were on a double bill with Herbie. We played before him. And uh, I remember we just got to the parking lot, and Herbie was just there, and uh, he gave us all hugs. <laughs> I just thought that was amazing because he was uh, just a hero of mine. You know? Isn't he the coolest guy? I mean, just the most open human being. Just, just, like, just, just like a normal guy, you know. He's like the most legendary pianist, you know. In fact... Uh, you know, a lot of pianists after him kind of refer to his approach to harmony or chords as like Herbie chords. You know, they'll say, you know, play some Herbie chords, you know. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of defined a whole style of playing, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, with on this subject of improv, um, a lot of what me and Dave are talking about tonight and what we learned stemmed a lot from him passing on some of the stuff that Miles passed on to him. So that whole mentality, you know, I mean, he would easily state that a whole lot of it came from Miles Davis too. Right, Dave? Oh, is Dave still there? Yeah, no, yeah, I was muted. Uh, yeah, a lot of it did A lot of it did come from him. And it, and it was at a time, oddly enough, because I know he used to share with us that uh, he was like 19 years old when he got with Miles. Right. So the first part of him being with Miles was just literally trying to keep a gig. 
you know, it wasn't. <laughs> I think one time we were watching one of these things, a uh, documentary somebody did on jazz, and the guy came across and he was just talking about Herbie. And I'm going like, is that what you were thinking? He's like, that's not at all what I was thinking. He's like, I was 19 years old, and I was trying to keep a gig, you know. And, and it was just interesting because, you know, he was just being real. He's, he had all the same emotions as any musician. You know, it's like, hey, man, this is what I was trying to do. This this was the cat, and, and you get called to play by the cat. You, you don't want to lose the gig. Yeah, yeah. You know. what, was in, what was interesting to me, Dave, too, and expand on it some more, because the biggest point that when he was kind of telling us about it, he, he, the thing that stuck with me was when he said that um, Miles wanted the guys to make mistakes because he felt if they weren't making mistakes, they weren't reaching anymore, they ain't got too comfortable in the gig. You better – you better be reaching to make uh, do something. He don't mind having a mistake pop up every now and then because it shows that you're trying to stretch. That's it. That's it. That's what it was all about. That's what it was all about. And it, and and all those guys, you can see in the downline of them, the 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 bands that they choose. Even now, if if any of you're into like Wayne Shorter, and you look at his quartet and some of the guys he has, Danilo Perez on keys and. Uh, Brian Blades on drums, it, you know, you, you just sit and watch what four guys do. It's phenomenal, uh, you know, just especially the musicianship. I mean, just you just just watch the extent of it, and you're going to see that same Miles ethic carried on, carried on to the to the next group. You know. Yeah, yeah, and um, but you know what's interesting to me, guys? Um, see, like. Like I said, we've got, had a chance to be become really masters of improvisation. We didn't even know it because, it, like you said, a lot of it was just simply trying to keep the gig, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, David mentioned some things he saw me do, just trying to get through some things, and I started trying to reflect on some 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 of the creative things I had to do. So Bill, you'll probably appreciate this. You know the um, director um, um, uh, Taylor Hackford. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so Taylor Hackford, I was uh, working uh, with him on a movie uh, years ago. I can't even remember the title of the movie, but it, they had a scene in the movie where they had a Foley guy. It was it was a bomb, and it was an old movie, old footage of, of a bomb, like from World War II or whatever. And um, he hated the sound that was on there. It just was bugging the heck out of him. And so... Um, you know, I'm just kind of a young cat in there hanging out. I wasn't the main engineer, but I was assisting. And, um, you know, he just it just kept bugging him. And I was just asking him, I said, well, you know what, I got I got an idea. Uh, could I try something? And he was real cool. He's like, sure, go ahead, kid, whatever. So I went out and went to the kitchen at uh, Lion's Share because we had a teapot in there. So I put the teapot on, got that sucker to start whistling, recorded it. They didn't even know what was going on. I just vanished for a little bit, came back in, got nice. a teapot, put it through, um, put it through like so I could achieve the Doppler effect so I wouldn't put some real-time pitch shifting in. I can't even remember what I used, but it was like it was a hardware unit, and it was real crude back then. Or maybe I even did it to tape and did the manual thing. I can't think of what it was to make it seem like it's falling, and then I kind of moved right. the microphone away. Just some That was improv, and he loved it. It ended up being in the movie. And that and, was the bomb uh, coming in. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, just my, I don't know what may, I had never done anything with any kind of foley or anything like that. But right away, I knew, I said, you know what, we got a teapot in the other room, and that kind of reminds me of that old sound. Maybe that's what he's looking for. So I tried it, and he liked, loved it. Nice. You know. So you know, improv and Dave, Dave, yeah. boy, let me tell you, improv at uh, Paisley Park Studios for Prince. <laughs> <laughs> now you oh, really got some improv <laughs> going yeah. on there. Yeah, we we used to have some very interesting things to do. One one of the things is that you know everything he writes, he intends on performing, and and one of the things that was going on is that there were only large studios there. This is like 2005, 2006 when we first came, and I was trying to tell him, you know, people don't really write like this anymore, and. When you you know a lot of the new artists who you see now, Alicia Keys and all these people who are big now, he would call them in before anybody knew about them, and he would spend time with them. Yep. And some of them would flourish, and some of them would be intimidated because they're coming on in the time of of developing without ever being or spending great amount of time in a large format studio. So we built a couple of little rooms that were simulations of small studios. 
but they had everything in order to get him to come into it. I had to put everything in there that he liked, which means they had to have two inch machines connected to them. They had to have all the the, the traditional analog stuff, but the look of them was still DAWs. It was you know we had Pro Tools, Logic, and every form of a basic DAW that the young artists would work with. And uh, at one point. He didn't like the sound, and, and it was like, okay, I've done everything but put the kitchen sink in this thing. And I'm like, what do I give the person who everything he wants to play, he wants to be on stage? So I said, ah, I know. <laughs> and I called DV, I called the 8 Day Sound, who was doing the tour at that time. I said, man, send me a couple of DV boxes, man. I'm going to put the same boxes that he uses as his wedge. I'm going to put them in the wall. And oh, I ain't going to yeah. say nothing. <laughs> I remember. Oh, yeah. And, and I put him in the wall, and, and, and after that, he didn't say nothing because it was <laughs> the same stage sound, but it was now in the studio, and it was just, you know, it, it's that energy. You know, a lot of times people want that same energy, and he's the type that that energy will feed him, you know, and, and so in the creative process, it helps. Now, the, the SPL level was out of this world. You know, because you didn't have to do anything. Those DB boxes are really, really great boxes. They're super loud, but really clear and and really, you know, doesn't take a lot to push them. And so, uh, but yeah, it was just improvising all the time because we were trying to get get him to look at the DAW concept while still embracing two inch tape, and that's. It's a challenge. It's a challenge sometimes because you have to always be able to capture the moment, but you got to also kind of respect what's going on. You know, you don't want to send somebody over the cliff because all they want to do is stay in analog. But you have to, at some point, embrace the DAW because the DAW gives you the speed to work. You know, it gives you the ability to, to, to deliver multi-projects. And eventually we were able to transition a lot of the work over to DAW. But it was, you know, it was just through trying to meet these other needs, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, there's a bunch of things like that. We used to get into some big, big, uh, not arguments, but, you know, big discussions because he, he, he wanted certain things that, you know, at some point I, I used to tell the guys, man, we're, we're arguing gravity right now. <laughs> and and because because that's what it is, you know. This is somebody insisting, no, I can fly. I'm telling you, I can fly. You know? <laughs> and you know what? If, I believed if I if I stayed there a little while I'm longer and argued gravity side, he probably would have flown. So, <laughs> but but inevitably, you know, there 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 there's just some, sometimes there's limits. Technically, I was just trying to make everything possible we wanted to do. But sometimes it was challenging. You know, we went through a little period where we were trying to do Jimi Hendrix type stuff. You know, and and one of the things in in talking with Jimmy's engineer and in just discussing and, and doing history on on the whole Jimmy thing and the, what what was happening when he cut a lot of the stuff overseas. You know, we're in the United States, so uh, there's only so much you can do to simulate 240. Yeah. 240 in the U.S. is not 240 in the U.K. You know, you can get a step-up transformer, you can do it, but but it's not the same thing. Not the same thing. But you you can do a lot. But you know, so there were a lot of times we had to improvise there, and and uh, you know, when that that happens, you got to do what you can do just to try and add. The, the electronics and make that work in your favor in order to meet what the, the artist wants to do. But, you know, a lot of times that's how you that's how you get great little things that appear on records. They'll, they'll do a whole bunch of stuff, just like Talika was talking about, and it'll be just little things. You know, one of the biggest hits for uh, Herbie was, uh, what is it, uh, with the Headhunters. Um, I want to say Watermelon Man or, or, or one of the others, but um, who was it? Uh, Bill Summers blew into a Heineken bottle. And that blown into a Heineken bottle is now the wee boo, wee boo. Everybody does it. Oh right, yeah. Oh, you know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and 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 um you know that but that was improvisation. You know, cat just making a sound. But that sound is now the earmark of that tune. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of things like that, man, that 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 they just happen and they're stamps. You know, just like uh Bill had that tune he played early on. That uh, whatever the tune was, they borrowed part of Africa from Toto. Oh yeah, <laughs> and that front exactly. end, that front end on Africa is a signature. 
you yeah. know, so it, yeah. so it sets up that expectation. But you know, again, that's part of what the sound, the layers, and everything that was going on back then. It was just immense, and and that's part of the uh, of great music, you know. So a lot of times, these little improvisations, the little guitar parts, the little the little quirky sounds that you don't know where they're coming from. It's it's a it's a real a real occurrence, you know. I mean, we work with one of the other guys we work with is really good is Wawa Watson and and uh, just the whole experience of understanding what a guitar can do on a record mm. when he shows you layering of guitar sounds and guitar parts is a pretty intense thing and then when you go back and you look at the history of some of the music and some of the hits and you're going like wow this is one cat but these are like nine guitar parts all in one song. Yeah, right, and, right. And it really makes the difference because it's adding all this flavor in there. The music is solid. But yep. all these little accents, I man, they're just like little improvisations of the moment. And, and they they flavor it up, you know. So. Well, what was that song uh, we redid, um, uh, Wah Wah, the um, one that Norman Whitfield did um, uh, with uh, The Temptations? Oh, it, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Yeah, right. So when we yeah. were doing that and everything, man, there was so many guitar parts going on and everything. But it was real interesting how he was talking about how Norman Whitfield put everybody through hell putting that track together, but he knew exactly what he was doing. You know, he would tell the bass player, just play doo doo. Doo doo doo. Yep. And that's it. And the, the bass player would want to go in and go, you know, do do, do 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 do. You know, he wanted to do, no no, just do do, do do boom boom. Nothing yeah. else. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Then um, Wawa put in his parts. All the other things stack it. But by the time all that stuff came together, oh, it was just it was magic, you know. Yeah. And um, but you know, so that was a case of improv. Saying okay, don't you know? It's just, this needs to be scripted. We don't need yeah. a lot of improv on this one. <laughs> so wait, do we know who did the original Rolling Stone, Khalid? Because y'all got me the other week with, uh, with that uh, Whitney didn't do that song. It was yeah, no, that was the temptation. Was Dolly Parton. That. <laughs> yeah, it was Dolly Parton. Y'all got me with that. I was like, huh, Dolly? Uh, that's just <laughs> an age thing, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all got yeah. me with that. So who did the original Rolling Stone? Papa was a Rolling Stone. It was a yeah. Temptation. Temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, All right. yeah it was them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, it was very interesting to me, that whole um, thing of um, knowing when to do it and when not to do it. You know, sometimes um, uh, you just got to let it go. One of the things that made me the most nervous, um, you know, a lot of times was um, punching in and punching out on tape, you know, because that's an improv thing. You're, you become part of the band, and if you screw it up, you know, and if the cats are gone, <laughs> you done kill thousands of dollars. So mm -hmm. when we were in the studio, and you remember, Dave, you attest to it, too, when Prince was doing real-time punch-in <laughs> and punch-outs on the two-inch tape of live a live horn section that they had been long gone. But this guy had no fear. You know, it was right on the beat. Impeccable timing. I would never try it. You know, that's yeah. that's one of those cases. Is, no, I don't want to get kicked out the room, so I <laughs> you yeah. go for it. <laughs> I, had yeah. some, I had some improv I had to do this week. Um, I I had a track that was sent to me where... Instead of getting 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 tracks of drums, I got three tracks of drums. I got a kick, and I got two more microphones, which were set up in Glenn John style. Oh, okay, yeah. Three mi yeah. microphones on your drum kit. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, when they set up the Glenn Johns, they also, not only did they record the drums, but the bass and the guitar were playing at the same time. Ah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, ah, wow. I love it. What did you do? <laughs> well, what happened was, well, I ac actually ended up mixing it twice. The first time I mixed it the way I normally mix, which was individual elements first and then put in the other stuff, that didn't work. So what I ended up having to do was put up the Glenn Johns, put up the kick. I triggered the kick with Slate Trigger, and I put the uh, Led Zeppelin kick on it. And then, so I had the, the Zeppelin kick holding it down, the two 
uh, 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 actual drum left and right. But then what happened was I had to accentuate the guitar and the bass that was already in it with the individual tracks, mm -hmm. which is opposite from how I normally mix. I normally yeah. mix individuals first and then ambiance. Yeah, see that that was a great lesson. It's it's so great yeah, it when you get stuff like that. Yeah, because it just it just, you just gotta completely reverse your whole um uh thought process the way you normally do things, and really that's the way stuff was done. It used to be you know stuff was ca captured in a couple of mics, and anything else came in and filled it in. So that's a good way to reverse that approach. Any of y'all that are watching, you should just make yourself do that sometimes. It really is a good way to give you a different perspective on that and the other thing is is like you said when you've got a drum kit and I had to go through this many times when um you know coming up back in the day all it was was live stuff you know so many times if you got something and it wasn't recorded with enough uh with enough uh gobos or barriers to block right. out the enough yep. sound you you got leakage is all part of it all that motown stuff is tons of leakage if you there's a lot of motown multi tracks floating around and if you if run into any of those or study them you'll see i mean it's just leakage all over the place everything is on everything because they were all in the same room and um, they made it work. So that's when you just switch that other mentality and say, okay, I'm stuck here with this is one thing. So let me think of this like a drum kit is supposed to be a whole kit, you know, not the individual element. So that forces you back to thinking of the whole sound that you've got as just one big blob of sound and then let me fill the other things in to expand it the way I need. Great. It was a great lesson, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I, I had a question for Greg. Um, in in doing some of the like commercial spots that you guys do, um, when you're doing those, do you ever find yourself because of time or or whatever? Because you're doing a lot of different styles of, of backing music and stuff. Do you ever find yourself having to improv? But are you? Does it? Does the clock pressure you? Just sometimes have to be real ingenious. Um. I mean, I actually use a lot of improvisation um, when I'm composing a track. Um, kind of opposite, I guess, of probably how I started out doing it, which was taking a lot more time to consider an idea in my head. Nowadays, I just kind of, you know, I review the materials, whatever materials I'm given. If I'm given boards, you know, the video, the script, or whatever, a brief from the client. And I'll sometimes just immediately put down an idea quickly. And I usually improvise something, you know. I kind of, uh, you know, I, I get a sense of maybe a kind of rhythm, you know, just quickly in my head or a tempo or maybe a certain key. It's going to be major, minor, or whatever, you know, or a certain kind of bass line. And I just get it down, you know, quickly. So I consider that to be kind of improvisation. I try to get something out of my head quickly and then almost kind of carve it in a sense, maybe a little bit like a sculpture, you know, where I, I throw something out. It doesn't have to be perfect, but then I kind of see what I have, you know. And sometimes if it's a 30-second spot, I'll just let that 30-second spot run and I'll just start playing chords, you know. I'll maybe put the click on a certain tempo that I feel... Um, would work for the spot, and I'll just start. I'll just start playing, you know. And oftentimes, that ends up being what I go with, <laughs> you know, because I just kind of react to uh, uh, what I see, you know, in in, in the storyline or the picture, you know, whatever yeah. feeling I'm, I'm getting from it. Do you find over the years, like your different clients, you know, I, I was looking at your stuff before we started, and, and it's like between like Mercedes and. Old Navy and all these different, you know, even Yves Saint Laurent. Do you find you've gotten quicker over the years, just at, at being interpreted when you see an image? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, still a lot of times. Well, I don't want to say a lot of times, but I still sometimes get it wrong. <laughs> you know, like what I decide to do. Um, you know, like you said, there's always time, you know, uh, there's always a deadline and, and pressure, so sometimes you kind of miss something, but I mean, through the years, I've, I, I think I've gotten better at that. Um, but 
like I said, um, I spend a lot less time considering something in my mind. Like years ago, I would, you know, th sit there and think of like 50 things and think, oh, that's not good enough. No, that one's not good enough. It's got to be like this amazing thing. You know, now once I hear a melody in my head or think of kind of a, a groove or something, I'll just put it down and I don't spend as much time second guessing myself and, you know, overanalyzing it and considering it. You know, I kind of I trust a little bit more my intuition and, and my gut, you know. Um, and I think having a background in jazz has kind of helped me to improvise my compositions a little bit more. Uh, just since I have an understanding of kind of harmony and, and, and things like that, um, you know, I kind of, it's, it's, it's not too difficult for me to put down some you know, basic layout of what I'm going to do, you know. And then from there, like I said, I'll go and go back and shape it, you know, and, and oftentimes then it gets, you know, it can get crazy. I mean, you can really, you know, start reshaping it in all sorts of ways. But I, I find just getting out of, out of my head quickly really helps, you know, because you're almost giving yourself, like, you're almost creating, like, a feedback loop for yourself. Um, you know, you, you get it out of your head, and then you're able to consider it differently rather than if it was all just contained in, in inside your head, you know. You put it out there, and you listen to it, you know, and then you, you, you get a sense of what's working and what's not and what you need to do from that point. You know? yeah, and also, yeah. it, just, it just gets past that initial fear of mm. getting started. <laughs> yeah, that's that, the most uh, tough thing sometimes, you know, it's just like, you know, you could spend like two hours just, just, you know, being nervous about getting started, you know, but once you put an idea down, you just start getting inspired and it gives you feedback, you know, about what you need to do and where you need to go. Yeah. Um, you now, another thing that, that I do differently now is I don't spend a lot of time initially getting sounds, you know, I'll, you know, if, if, if I know I want to use maybe an acoustic bass, you know, I won't necessarily spend time loading up my, you know, best bass patch, you know, like in Trillion or something. You know, I'll just get like a stock acoustic bass and, you know, just to get the parts down, just to get things out of my head. And then from there I can go back and I can, you know, really consider all the, all the actual sounds and, you know, maybe getting, a, you know, a much better sample or whatever I want to use for my sounds. You know? Yeah, that that you know that is huge, Greg. I was doing a um coaching session earlier today with a client and trying to get him because I'm a big av advocate that your intuition will lead you right if you just let it grow and everything. So I was trying to get him out of trying to script every little thing. I'm like, just get it out. Don't self-edit right away. You can come back and get it later. But if you get a flow going, like you said, to get that first note happening, and then you can always come back and get the perfect sound, and you can hear whether that first note that you started with, it doesn't have to be the ending note. But just get it rolling. It'll trigger a whole sea of other things uh, flowing down that river, and before you know it, you've got something that's masterful, but your intuition just kind of knows, so when you just let it roll and um, get it out there and don't self-edit, you're going to come up with a groove, you're going to come up with the right parts, they're just going to kind of fit in there for the most part, they're going to kind of lead you in the right direction, then you refine. Wouldn't you agree with that? I think once you get it out, then your intuition and also your, your background, your training, um, you know, will help you to shape it in, in the right way. Right. Uh, but I, I really think uh, that's that's huge, you know, just to, just to get it out there. And I think, though, it takes time to learn to trust your intuition, um, to realize, you know, if I come up with a melody, um, you know, a lot of times I'll, you know, I'll go with that melody, the first thing that I think of, you know, that'll end up being the hook of the tune, you know, it's yeah. just... It just came to me in my mind, you know, and instead of thinking, oh, it could be 50 other things that are, you know, better and I can do it different, differently, you know, I'll, I'll just go with it, you know, and, and, and trust my intuition, you know, and realize that, you know, why not? You know, that melody is, that melody is perfectly fine, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> three yeah. notes, you know, so what? You know, it's great. It's, yeah. it's perfect. One of the things that, that used to happen to me a lot, uh, which piggybacks off of what Greg was saying, is that... I used to spend a lot of time on drum patterns. 
I used to spend a lot of time on drum patterns because I'm like, okay, I'm going to do Back in Black now, so I've got to get it exactly the way the drums were. And what happens is when you do that, you get so bored by the time it takes you to program <laughs> the Back in Black drums. <laughs> you don't care anymore, and you just quit the whole project. You're like, I'm, I'm going to do something else. So what what worked for me was, okay, you're like, okay, I know what the tempo is. I know what the feel is. I'm just going to get some boom, bap, boom, boom, bap, boom, bap. Loop it. Mm -hmm. I'm going forward. Like Greg was saying, get back yeah, to the other right. stuff. Get back to nuances another time, but just get down what you need to get down to get your other parts in. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of um, what happens during the uh, creation process is you're kind of gauging your energy, where your energy is, and just like you said, Bill, with you know the drums, if you get stuck on one thing for too long, you kind of exhaust um, your creative energy a lot of times. You know, so it's the same thing. If I was to sit here and mull over, you know, a million compositional ideas. You know, my, you know, I'm also at risk of losing um, maybe something more immediate and absolutely primal about the creation process. You know, it's like two hours later, you know, I'm not going to have that level of objectivity, you know, that I did if I just kind of got something out quickly, you know, so... I know what happens to me. What's happening if you're mixing, you're composing? That's you're you're always kind of working with your level of energy, and <laughs> you know the the clock is ticking, and and you're kind of you know I, I think it takes time, you know, to kind of understand that and to to know how to work with that, you know. Great. Uh, your 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 creative energy. Yeah. Sorry. Fred. No, no, I, I was just going to say, is, uh, I don't know if any of y'all run into this, but there's a phrase that always comes up when I get in that mode. It's like, what was I getting ready to do? <laughs> what was I getting ready to do? It always comes up. You know, I'll get down this rabbit hole of stuff and then totally can't remember. What the heck was I getting ready to do? <laughs> the, it, 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 it always ends up um, being better to just simply get your ideas out and then come back later on. It's really two different hemispheres of your brain, so you can't mix them. The brain does not release like that. You know, once you're in that one mode, you got to let it roll, and then the the other time, then you can come back, and that's using the other side. So they don't cross. They don't cross. Right. Another thing that I was thinking about as far as production and I, it's quasi improvising, but. Um, there's a Dave Grohl video where he talks about basically the hook or the chorus and basically the, the, the verse is getting you to the chorus and the chorus is what everybody is really attaching themselves to. So that's how I build. I build from chorus down. Like if I get a good chorus, then I say, okay, I'll put some filler in between there, but this is where we're going. We're really trying to get to the chorus, and this is the payoff. So yeah. that's what I do is that I'm looking at the chorus as the main thing and building backwards and almost downwards from the chorus. Like, the chorus is going to be the biggest thing, the largest thing, widest, tallest, and everything else is really getting us to that. Even if you start a song where the song starts with the chorus. Did you have any opinions on that? I, I think that's exactly the way to do it. You know, I've talked about that where you start with the highest energy part of the song and um, because that's the peak and everything. And when you get that, everything else should build towards that. And if you do that, more than likely, you know, this was something that um, I did not do at first. When I first started mixing and all that, I used to start at the beginning of the song, you know, work it and start putting all the things, get a great drum sound, get to all this and start putting all that. But later on, what I realized is you got to start where the most energy is because I would always run out of headroom back in the day when we were on the analog consoles especially. You know, the stereo bus would end up laying over the meters is just <laughs> leaning there. And I'm like, man, you know, and then you got to start pulling things down and everything starts sounding different. So when 
you start with the most energetic part of the song where the payoff is supposed to be and work your way back so that everything has to reach that point, most of the time you'll never even overload your stereo bus. You know, that took me a minute to, to figure that little logical thing. <laughs> yeah, hey, um, let me from say a technical standpoint as well as a, uh, a musical arrangement standpoint. You know? Right, right. So. I wanted to say uh, one thing, though. Um, we got my odd here. You being awful quiet, bro. You there? Everything good? You, you working? I'm, I'm right here. Can you hear me? Okay, we got you. We just wanted to be sure you're straight, man. I'm right here, y'all. All this stuff that you're saying right now is what I just went through. I went went through a little bit of hell through this today, trying to get artists to um, let go, trust me, trust them, and um, let what was in them come out. And um, y'all have spoken to me about um, how I talk to people, uh, like, I've asked you guys how to how to pull the the um, what is it the emotion out of people and and how to not shut them down, mm -hmm. you know. And I sit and I watch you guys talk to these these singers. And as I watch you guys talk to them, I'm trying to pick up stuff because I do it totally different than y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and today as I was talking to, there were two singers in there. One I had playing engineer, and um, I as I was talking to them, I was try. I, it was sort of an out of body experience. Because I was trying to not do what I would normally do. And I was trying to do what you guys said. And so it wasn't even me talking. As I, it, was, it was like, Kalik, you're talking for me. And I'm sitting here like trying to be Kalikish. You know, and, and try to trying to talk. That's, like, that's not you, bro. Don't do that. Don't <laughs> yeah, do that. Yeah. that. Don't do that. That ain't gonna work. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. I was you. trying. <laughs> no, I, no. I was you know the, the key, the key man. Now let me tell you. First of all, most people don't even know this. I changed my name to Kalik, you know, because my my birth name was Frank after my father. So and I lived up to that man, early on old. in my life. I, I lived up to that early in my life, <laughs> you know. I'm very I tell Frank, them, just go straight, <laughs> you know. And then um, it, it, that wasn't working. It's like you know, you you cutting right to the to the quick on people too much and everything. And I said, you know what? I got to change my name because that ain't really me, you know. But I was living up to that name for a while. So you 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 go straight too. You got the warriors uh, mentality and attitude. You're you're a boss. You're trying to get and gain the control. But the yes. one thing that uh, um, great leaders do is they understand the people. It's not about them. So we just take yourself out of that and go to where they're trying to go because you want the best for them and you want to lead them to the promised land. So yes. you just gotta take that out. But you got to be you, man. Don't try to be me. There was a time when I used to try to be like Dave because Dave is my boy and, you know, everybody loves Dave. So I was like, no, nah, that ain't going to work. Though. <laughs> you know, it just don't work out like that. Dave is I, I, one I and you. only original. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah you, you end up being a combination of a lot of different people. I'm a combination yeah. of a lot of people who gave me sh shots and chances and little things I pulled off of or and improvised. You improvise who you are. And, and, you know, right. so I'm a little bit of Herbie. I'm a little bit of every mm -hmm. client I've ever worked with and had a relationship with. I pull little things from them because I see it work for them, not only as artists, but navigating the industry. Mm -hmm. And so you really, you take those lessons. I mean, man, one, one valuable lesson I learned from Herbie, and I learned a whole lot, as you can tell, because we talk about him a lot. I learned how powerful one word is, and that one word is unacceptable. <laughs> and Great. I I had never seen anybody in an international setting just say one word and everything be straightened out. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, man, that is so cool. Mm -hmm. Just that one word. He wasn't kicking and screaming, wasn't making a big deal about nah, that's unacceptable. And then just kept moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Whoa, that's cool. It. You know, it, it just I'm, taught I'm me trying. because you know I'm from another side of town, and and we didn't have time to think up a word like unacceptable. We were like, <laughs> yo, <laughs> motherfucker, that <laughs> shit ain't right. You know, right. <laughs> but sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes that English doesn't work, and you need a higher level word. You know, and so <laughs> I, I I think a lot of that you're you're a combination, and, and I've told you this before, uh, my the, you you are. Uh, part of who, who you are is what you've done in your life. You know, you've got military background, 
So there is part of you that is going to address things in that fashion. Right. And so you got to make it work for you now that you're on the other side. You know, you you right. you're still on a mission. Just a different goal. Just a different I'm goal. I'm trying to have y'all rub off on me. I'm trying. <laughs> well, not not only rub off, but I think just you know, uh, like the old man used to say, moderation, son, moderation. That's what's you up. Know. Yeah, you know, yeah. don't dim your shine. You know? Right. Right. I, I I had success. I had success with the singer. But as I was doing it, I'm telling you, it was an out-of-body experience because that was not <laughs> me. And the words were coming out of my mouth, and I was trying to have them be pleasing <laughs> when I'm really wanting to choke somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, 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 singer, the singer was more than capable. The, the, the singer is extremely talented. There's, there's no pitch issues. Um, and the singer can sit there and write a whole song all by herself. It just needs editing. And so, but I wanted her to approach it from a total different standpoint, because if I get in there with you guys and you guys say, okay, we're going to come at it from this angle, she, which is different from what she does, she cannot sit there and say, well, that's not how I do it. No, 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 no. I'm not putting you in front of these, you, I'm not going to put her in front of you guys and then have her start coming up with excuses. So I told her, here's your situation, you have to deal with it, you've got the talent, go. And she just froze, and, I, and it, it took an hour and a half for her to come up with a simple melody and be secure with it. And then when we laid it, when we got it all done, it was, it, it's wonderful. And she's sitting there, but well, I wouldn't have did this. I said, that's exactly the point. You wouldn't have done this. It's, I'm getting you out of your box, having you do something totally different, and it's still you. And, and I, I told her this way, when we go to do a song, not all your songs have to be, have to sound like you. I'll go listen to Prince songs, and he's written a song for somebody else, or Sinead O'Connor singing his song, and it sounds like Prince. Mm -hmm. Somebody singing a Babyface song, John B., and it sounds like Babyface. I want her to be able to create and you not even know who it is so that she can switch and switch again. And, and she's like, oh. And I said, and you're sitting here fighting me. I'm giving you greatness and you're fighting me. And I, and I told her, I said, I, I can't sit here and fight you and keep calm. And, and I started winding up and I just thought about Khalid and how, how you mm -hmm. do your stuff. And I was like, okay, calm down. <laughs> not, not what Kalik will be doing. He, this is his old brother. Man, you you gonna you gonna bust a blood vessel, man. Look at your forehead right now. <laughs> right, you see the vein. You see the vein. The veins. Yeah. popping just yeah. talking about it. Yeah. I'm I'm very yeah. You know I'm very passionate about it. I I want I want what Motown had that that intensity that that high quality that high standard. I want to work toward that, and I want the people around me working toward that. I want us to really struggle and work hard and build ourselves for that. So, yeah, stuff's unacceptable. It's, it's just, yeah. we, we got to work for it. And what's, what's funny is I'm exactly the opposite. That uh, I, I, I recognize that you can't get a certain intensity into a track unless the singer gives you that intensity. But you can fit shift it all you want. And you can time shift it all you want. I love pitch shifting and time shifting. I don't care. Just give me the action. Give me the rah, 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 and I will put it where it's supposed to be. Don't worry about all that. So I'm totally opposite from him in that. I don't care about any perfect performances, none of that. Just give me the action, and I will place it where it's supposed to be because that's where the technology is today. Yeah. Well, see, that's the evolution. Uh, that's evolution and... And um, improvisation mixing together in your two styles, right? What, what right. he's just described, <laughs> what he's just described, and what you just described about yourself—that's evolution meeting automation. Okay, and and you're going to have somebody in in the number line. You're going to have uh, all kinds of different things that people arrive at, and and that's what you have. One is going to love plugins and say, okay, it's 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 the plugin life for me. And and, and 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 I can make all that it happen. And the other one's gonna say, no, I need the natural nuances that are found in 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 the uh, acoustic performance. So, you know, I think that that and that's part of where we're at right now with, you know, the the whole approach to engineering. There, there is no wrong answer. There, there's what's right for each situation. You know, and and. You know, uh, Greg, you look like he has something to say, especially because, you know, you're coming from doing all these disciplines. You guys should go to his site and take a look at the different. Oh yeah, I saw his site. You got yeah, all the this. different clients. I mean, that's that that that's a that's a whole other thing right there. Being able to handle all those lanes at once. Yep. 
Um, let me say something real quick, though, because um, what I think we all want to do, the message that I know that I like to perpetuate now, and um, when we talk to some of our engineer peers and producers and things like that, the thing that everybody has to realize is we've got all these tools and everything and use them. I'm all for all that, but let's always remember that it's about the music first. You know, it's about the final thing. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm not against using the technology bill or anything to to get things and improve it. But at the same time, I'm not against um, calling somebody out on when they're slacking to Absolutely. say, push yourself. You know, yep. push yourself. You can do better than that. You know, yeah, I could. F f make something kind of acceptable on, all, on my end and everything, but th that's shortchanging you, and I want the best for you. Go ahead and do that, because I'm going to uh, call bullshit on you that you're, you're slacking, you know, and a lot of people don't like to hear it, but they always thank you when you push them to that little extra, even though you could make their life easier. You know, don't make it easier necessarily when you know you got somebody that's got some talent and all they need to do is, because what it does is they train themselves to be lazy. And that's where we're trying to make our music elevate in general, this music industry, is people have gotten lazy and they don't have to fight for things like like we used to have to fight. That's why this subject is improvisation because we had to fight to get all these little things together. You know, uh, I, in, in the moment, I'm going to... Um, I want us to start rattling off a list of improvisation. You know, I'll start it off with a couple of things. I want to talk about one of the things that was improvisation. We used to um, fly vocals, for example, background vocals with tape. You know, that's improvisation like a mug and, like a mug and so rough to get it and get it right. You know, we, then, then after tape, we came up, we had this little uh, digital delay called the AMS that had a little switch on it. was like one of the first samplers. We put a little snippet of the delay thing in there. It would, it would save it and capture it. And Roland and a couple other ones did it too. And then we used that to manually fly stuff in improvisation. I told you about the teapot. Um, uh, reamping and things like that, or improvisation when you don't quite have something, so you run it back out and run it through the speakers and re-record it and everything. Um, another improv improvisation, like um, one thing I do, I, I so on some drum live drum things, I would use a thing, the thing that uh, was called the sub kick, you know. But I never owned a sub kick, so if it wasn't wasn't available and I figured I needed it, I had to do some improvisation. So I'd make a sub kick. I'd find me a little speaker or get an NS10 or whatever and wire it like a microphone, and then that's improvisation to get the the result that I want. So I named five things right there. Uh, anybody else want to add to that list? Greg does. Well, I don't, know, I don't know if this would, uh, you know, be along exactly those lines, but uh, a couple pieces I did recently, I, um, I, I guess I must have made some mistakes, you know, on the, on, the keyboard, on the computer keyboard or something. I hit some things wrong, and it actually produced cool results. Um, you know, I, I use Logic, and, you know, I think in those pieces, those mistakes actually ended up being, like, the hooks <laughs> the last couple things I did. And uh, I think, like, part of the thing is that um, once you start paying attention to it and be willing to accept that, um, then you start to notice those things, you know, like, um, in the past I might have thrown those things out because I said, oh, uh, that wasn't intentional, you know. I, I made a mistake doing that. Um, but actually... I I don't I don't know why. Like I said, it's weird. I think maybe just because my mind was open to it, that I was willing to accept it, that I actually heard what I did. You know, I hit I hit like the wrong key command or something, and something happened where you know a piece of audio moved or something, and you know I played it back and I was like, that's actually really good. You know, yeah. <laughs> and I went with it and you know I probably I used that in like five sections of the piece. You know, it became great. So. Um, I don't know if that's along the same lines, but yeah, uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's kind exactly of right. it is. You know, where you're just flexible and willing to, uh, you know, go with what's going on in the moment, you know. Yeah, yeah. We did a thing on one of our previous um, hangouts too, where we did some improv, you know, because the guys uh, Mod had brought a group on there and they were playing their thing and they had some vocals going on, but uh, you know, things 
could have been elevated to another level. So we all just came in and did the improvisation of reversing the vocal and just listening for ideas. And when and when you heard the vocals in reverse, it suddenly just opened up all kinds of new possibilities. I, uh, you know, I don't even know where it is now or what the, if any happy accidents have come out of it. But just going through that th thought process opens your mind to other possibilities because we can get real comfortable in, you know, what we first hear or what we've gotten used to hearing over and over again and maybe not stop reaching for something new. So something as simple as that, you know, doing a little bit of jazz on what you're working on and it's like, oh, I kind of like that, you know. So, yeah, we're doing that kind of thing. Um, it's kind of just being open to to accidents, you know, and, and to, like it's it's like being open to anything that's going on in your in your environment. Anything that happens, you can react to it. You know, you could bring it into your composition. You know, into your production. Um, yeah, me. There's actually a great uh, jazz pianist uh, named Kenny Werner, and uh, he's very it's very philosophical, and uh, he talks about an exercise that he does at the piano where he sits down and he just basically lets his fingers drop on the keyboard, like he does this every morning, mm -hmm. and uh, he just says to himself, that's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard, you know, <laughs> no matter what it is, it could be a crazy cluster of, you know, like 50 notes or whatever, and there's something about doing that exercise that just opens him up to any kind of sound, it kind of takes away the, um, the need to make everything perfect and to control everything and to just sit back and to take in what's going on, you know, in, in your environment. Yeah, that's so cool, man. Well, let me um uh, do a quick little, basically, uh, talk to the people out there as a little ID to let you know I'm Colleague Glover, also known as ColecoVision, and I'm the host of this Hangout here. We are working with uh, some very special guests here. I've got my partner and longtime friend Dave Hampton on here with me. We've got some Pensado students. We have Bill Kamek. We have Maad Hotep. And we also have Greg Fine here. And um, you guys are getting some great information. Our subject today has been we've been talking about improvisation, you know, but not in the way that you think of getting on and doing a solo on guitar or something like that. It's improvisation through career, through life, through getting. Uh, through situations and what I want to do is finally direct something further to Greg because Greg you do um, you know you got a, a, a wide scope of clients that you work with on there but um, you I want to find out it, because it's real easy to get caught in a certain flow and kind of go with that in a templated fashion for example you've got a lot of um, hair people, you know, some of the people that um, you've done stuff for, hair products, hair care products, and things like that, car things and all that. So it's real easy to maybe, you know, maybe you do start with a template or whatever, nothing wrong with that, but do you ever have to fight off the danger of, of creating a templated workflow and not impro improvise like, you know, to really get the nuggets out there? Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, after you, you know, do so much stuff, you kind of you fall into routine ways of doing things. And uh, I remember one thing I did um, where I just kind of wanted to get out of my head, out of my normal thought process. Um, so instead of working in the traditional way of kind of, you know, figuring out, you know, this chord is going to go to that chord to that chord, Instead, what I did was I kind of created a production, maybe 16 bars long, um, you know, which I did create in, in a more traditional sense, but then I just kind of went into my DAW and randomly moved things around, and I created maybe four or five different versions of that 30-second spot, but with all the different elements just randomly placed. Um, so, you know, maybe dropping out the drum break in a certain part, maybe taking the bass line that was in the first two bars and moving it to, you know, eight bars later or whatever. Um, and when you do that, um, you know, again, you become more like an objective observer. You know, then you can take the material that you created with your normal thought process and see what happens, you know, and, and let stuff hit you, you know. So, you know, you do that, you mix things up, 
and then you listen, you know, and you say, oh, man, that's really cool what happened right there, you know. A lot of times, like, you don't get anything good. <laughs> that, you know, truly, that's what happens. But sometimes you get some amazing things, you know, and you realize that, you know, you didn't even need, like, all those eight parts happening simultaneously, like, just that bass line and maybe that percussion part, like, create something really incredible, you know. And then from there, you take, like, your favorite parts and you go back and you, um, you know, then you leave them together in some kind of way. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's good to have ways to get out of your normal routine way of doing things because, yeah, after you do, you know, like 100 hair products, you kind of, you know, you fall into a routine and you're like, okay, I know, you know, what this is supposed to be, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it can end up being stale, you know, and, and kind of sucking, you know, in the end. You always want to do something, something fresh, you know. So... You know, you, you kind of create games, um, and it's almost like if somebody else would, would do it, you know, because everybody's going to do it a little bit differently. You know, so it's almost like you're giving yourself a chance to listen to maybe how somebody else would do it, you know, because things are random all of a sudden. Um, another thing uh, that I've done is maybe substitute the visual image with another one, you know, something that maybe has a, a, the same kind of energy, um, you know, to inspire the creation for what I'm doing, you know, because sometimes, you know, you're working on an ad, it's, there's nothing inspiring in there, you know, it's like, you know, you're trying to write music for a toilet paper commercial, you know, it's like, you know, I don't feel any passion about this. <laughs> much, you know, emotion, you know, to give to this thing. So... <laughs> you didn't get inspired by toilet paper, man? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, on the other hand, sometimes you get something that's amazing, you know, an amazing, amazing visual, you know, thing that's almost like a movie, you know, but when you don't, you need to find ways to inspire yourself. You know, you don't want to write music for, you know, nothing. I mean, you know, you need to, you need to feel something. So... You know, even in just the most generic commercial, you can still find what the essential character may be or the essential kind of uh, takeaway um, that they're trying to present, you know. But and then maybe go and find a, a different picture or a different, uh, you know, piece of video or something that has something similar that can inspire um, something that will work for that commercial that you're doing. You know, so I might just go on YouTube and just randomly kind of look for keywords that might um, come up with things that could relate to the product I'm working on. Uh, and then visually, you know, I'll kind of work off of that, you know, and then maybe go back to my piece and see, you know, how it's working. Question uh, for you. Question. Um, it seems to me like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to me like... Um, you do a lot of car ads and stuff like that. It seems like to me like that would automatically be inspiring. Like it would be energetic and forceful and aggressive and everything. Is it or is it something else for you? What what which when you get that certain type of product project in and it's like oh yeah okay I, I'm I'm ready for this every time. Have you found a certain style that just stokes you right away? Um, a certain style. Um, no, a product. It probably is something more along the lines of like a car commercial, something with with energy. I mean, honestly, a lot of times the client will send you um, a reference track, you know, or a temp track, and so you kind of have uh, an area to work off of. But if it's something that I can relate to more, you know, a car thing has something. Uh, fast-paced, energetic, more modern-sounding, maybe incorporating electronic elements and uh, things like that. If it's something I feel close to, you know, then... You know, it's, it's funny, there's also just... I'm not sure what it is, but there's certain spots you get where you feel kind of uh, a freeness. Um, sometimes you feel very trapped and constrained and kind of like, you know, you're working in this grid kind of thing. Um, but sometimes, I'm not sure what it is, maybe there's certain pictures that just inspire you and, and you, you have more of a, a freeness where you feel like you can just try things, you know. 
Um, you know, sometimes, like, I might take an approach where I'll start more from a sonic place, you know, and I'll just kind of look for cool sounds, you know, or I'll just play around with some, you know, I might take just a Rhodes or whatever and run it through different plugins, distortion, delay, you know, and come up with different sounds, you know, and then work around that. So, um, it's, it's a lot about trying to find the inspiration. You know, you have to find an inspiration to to work off. The worst thing is feeling like you're just working in a in a box, you know, there's it's just a horrible thing. <laughs> right, right, yeah. What, what is there any is there any particular genre or type of project that you know you struggle with when you get it in and it's always like a certain type of thing that you got to fight a little bit more to make it happen. Is there any this kind of like me, kryptonite yeah. for you a bit? Yeah, I mean for me the hardest things are when there's really no direction given at all. I mean this is Part of what I think improvisation is actually about is is creating constraints um, to work within because those are the things that give you information and inspire you um, about where to go. Like for me, the worst thing is when somebody just says, you know, we just want a happy or just an upbeat track, you know, because that can be, really be anything. I mean, if somebody tells me that, then there is just too many possibilities, you know, for me to even begin to get started, you know, so I'd rather if somebody, you know, maybe led me to like five different tracks that were kind of, you know, in the area that they're uh, along the lines of what they're thinking, um, or just gave me some key words or something to work from, you know, a tempo or, or anything. Um, so it's when things are too open-ended is when I tend to get stuck. I think a lot of composers are like that, you know. So, yeah, the more kind of um, almost limitations that I have to work with, the almost the more I can I can thrive. I think. Mm. Um, another thing is like on those hair products, like you said, like typically when you're doing hair products, there's a lot of uh, visual kind of cuts, starts and stops, mm -hmm. but um, sometimes it can be difficult to get the underlying track um, to work with all of those starts and stops and cuts. You know, like with the hair products, there's the woman spinning around and they want to show the hair and you, you, you're doing sound effect type things and, mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all the while that you're trying to get a track to flow through that. And uh, that can be really challenging, you know. Because sometimes, really, like in a 30-second spot, you know, that might be 16 bars, you know. And with all the cuts, I mean, you only might have really a couple bars to establish a groove or something. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's over before you know it. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so, and you're mainly a guitar player, right? Is that what mainly you said? Mainly a guitar player, yeah. I mean, I play keyboard and bass and percussion and different things in the studio. Um, but as far as, like, professionally, I've, you know, it's, it's been guitar. You start most things on guitar, or, or or does it just change according to your feel? Um, yeah, it changes always. You know, sometimes um, you know I could just pick up the bass and uh, just start playing a bass line. It's whatever I kind of feel is leading the uh, inspiration. You know, it could just be a drum part that I just kind of knock out quickly on the keyboard, just to kind of get like a pulse or a uh, a kind of uh, subdivision going. Mm -hmm. To establish the groove, uh, sometimes it can be guitar, sometimes it can be keyboard. You know, I just kind of see where the inspiration is. You know, for the for the track, so it's different every time. Cool, cool. Well, hey, Greg, thank you so much, man, for um, coming on with us and everything. And guys, what I want to do now, because we're getting close to our time here, I want to wrap it up with um, any final words of wisdom about this whole concept of improv. Anything that you can give to people to help. Um, I threw some things out earlier, but I'm going to try to think of some things. So if anybody has, like, one good nugget that will help you move forward in improvising, go ahead and do it now. Pitch it out there now so it will help folks. Anybody, go ahead and start it off. My, uh, well, go ahead. Do you think? Um, I, I just got one, and it's just a definition of improvisation. And it just says it's a state of being and creating action without pre-planning. So just, you know. Try and keep that in mind, you know. Uh -huh. 
just as, as an individual and with other people as well. Yeah. Bill? I think, I think it's important to remember that improvisation is part of production and the non-improvised part is the mixing and the quality control. So it's like when you're thinking up stuff to do, improvise. Go for it. It's all digital at this point. We're not even using tape. Nobody's even like spending money on tape. It's all digital. It's all on the computer. Do as many takes as you want. Do everything you want to do with it. Cut it up any way you want to do it. And then that is your improvisation. And then after that, you can do all your technical, very cut and dried box type stuff with the mixing. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, how about Mott? What you got? I've, I've, I, number one, I apologize for the, the music. We're trying to get, we got um, a project we need to get done. Um, I've got two things that I do. Um, I don't leave, I, I, everything that I want to do, I train for. So if, if I'm going to be putting on lipstick, I start training on lipstick. We're going to get good at putting on lipstick. Everything. <laughs> So, yeah, I know that's, that's, that's out of left field. Uh, <laughs> not the best <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. You got me worried, bro. You got Too me much worried information. Now. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm all straight over here. But, so, on, on the improv, like I said, everything we do, I train us for. So, um, one of the games that I play is I'll turn on the radio or a CD and I'll say, okay, pick a sound. And if you don't pick a sound, I'll pick a sound. And whatever that sound is in the song, you turn that into words. Because I'm, I'm, right now, my thing is songwriting and production. So coming up with these vocal melodies. So if we're, we're playing some jazz, whatever, and I pick out an oboe, okay, now you turn that into words. And I, and I get people used to doing this to where it's nothing. It's a game. This is our video game. This is what I turn this into. We like playing video games? Okay. This is our video game. We, we turn on songs. Here's Herbie Hancock. Here's this keyboard playing. Turn that into words. And the second part is we'll go back and forth where – Say I create some rhythm. Kalik turns that into words. Then, then I, then Kalik will create some diddly whatever. Then I turn that into words, and we just go back and forth um, and make it a game to where it becomes nothing. And and I do this um, is I was in the studio with Brian um, Keith from uh, Pensadia a, a couple of weeks ago, and when I wa I walked in the door, he had some stuff up, and I had heard outside as I was walking up the music. By the time I walked in the door, I had a melody. I said, hey, give me, give me, um, give me a track real quick. And I went in there, and, and I started to lay the vocal. And as I walked in to the booth, Brian, no, Freeman, F.L. Freeman said, wait, 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 wait. The singer has a melody. We, we, we got to make sure that she gets that down. I was like, bro, that's my singer. We got this. She can come up with a million melodies. It's nothing. The singer was all relaxed. It was Anna Ram. She was relaxed. Freeman was freaking out because we might lose a melody. A <laughs> We do. I'm like, dog, we do this all the time. We practice this. Mm -hmm. So for us, we practice this so that we don't, you know, we get good at doing this stuff. And so that's mine right there. Here's one of our, oh, speaking of which, speaking of which, real quick, Khalid. Oh, good. Remember I said that we were, we were gathering singers and we, uh -huh. we had this, that, that our guys have to put up or shut up, like show progress on what you and Dave have been showing us and telling us or whatever. Right. We, we started out with 10 singers. We, we got them in, picked 10 singers, got down to nine singers, you know, and then we even got rid of three, and then, you know, brought them back. Okay, all right, y'all get another chance, right? One of them <laughs> just walked in. I have no idea what she's here for, but she's here, and, and you know part of it is showing up, right? That's the big part. Showing up, and she just showed up. Hey, 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 hey. You showed up. That's huge. You get major she points who? for that. That's who is that? She who? Christy. Hey, Christy. Hi. Christy who? Christy with a K, oh, like Mystique. Oh, Mystique. Oh, Christy like Mystique. Mystique. All right. Yeah. That's just like okay. the X-Men. Like, like that? Like that's what's up. Ha! <laughs> the X-Men. Yeah, no, uh, I called uh, I called uh, H-Bomb and I called Draft to see if they were not doing anything today. And they were like, yeah, you can come in. Because so. okay. they right. just talked to us yesterday, so I was like, okay, I'm going to make an effort now to, to come in. I want to cut you off, though. Okay, you done walked in. Sing! What? Ah, here we go. Here hey. we go. <laughs> hey, and, and, Ch and Khalid, 
I keep telling them. I, I'm saying, look, if y'all are around me, when you get around these brothers, they're going to say, sing, and you're on. And I, I keep telling them. One girl was on the video camera. We're, we're videotaping this girl. Point, point the camera. Point the camera. Let's hear it. Point the camera. Let's... She's in the room Ready? now. Ain't no escape. Y'all don't, y'all don't see? Uh, okay. Now, well, Khalid. We ran her out. Y'all... <laughs> now, now, now watch this, Khalid. See, what am I supposed to do when a singer does that? I'm not supposed to choke them and cuss them out. And... See, I'm supposed to get up, put my do the Ike Turner type thing. That's what I'm ready to do. Like, it's illegal, but that you know, it's like, like, come on now. Point um, the camera. Point the camera. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Point the camera. What am I supposed to? I don't know. You can run if you want to. Anything. <laughs> Anything. Well, they can't oh. see. I've never heard her sing. I have no idea. I have no he actually, clue. Yeah, he has never heard sing, her sing. Sing three blind mice. mice. Three blind oh. mice. Anything. <laughs> All I've ever known. I know she's a model. I know she's a model. So I'm gonna find out just like y'all. All right. Sing and pose. Sing and pose. Sing and pose. <laughs> I'll be still now. Don't cry. Sleep as your rocks by the street. Sleep and remember my last lullaby. So I'll be with you when you dream. Got a pretty voice. Got a pretty yeah, voice. That's yeah. the sound. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll you know. be down. <laughs> I, I didn't know y'all. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. we're tough here. That that's the that's called the acid test right there. You know, you sing. You know, this you'd is be surprised. I'll meet people. Been like sing, and I'm like ah, like it's <laughs> for me. I'm not used to being on the spot like that. It's the first yeah. time I've actually done it though. So thank you. Guys. Okay, well you're model now. Good. Pose. Your model pose. See, she did that. She didn't See? hesitate on that. <laughs> See, that's what we got to get the singing to. It's like that. Yeah, Damn. So. <laughs> but that's cool. You did it, though. You got yeah. the man props for that. Thank you. <laughs> good. Very nice. Oh, sounded good. good. Sounded good. Thank you. All right. I'll be damned. Uh, I think H bomb brought her in, bro. I'm I'm not knowing. I'm I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. I, I keep telling them this is what it is. This is what it's gonna be, and they keep getting shocked when it happens. And I'm sitting there like, I told you, this is what it was. You know. <laughs> so. But anyway, yeah, I'll be working with her, uh, getting her to where she can improv. Some like I'm, I'm wanting to bring these singers out when you guys are at SAE or whatever. Like when you throw your your seminars, I'm wanting to bring them out and have them, you know, get to meet y'all face to face. Y'all can run them in through the ringer, choke them, whatever y'all want to do. Um, <laughs> introduce yourselves to them. Um, but yeah, so far I think I think we still have eight. You know, I, I think. We, I, I'm ready to just get rid. I get rid of people. I'm gone, gone, gone. Cause I don't want my time wasted, mm -hmm. and I, I take this very serious. And I'm not gonna have these people embarrass me, um, if I can have anything to do about it. So. I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel you. That's what's up. We haven't, we haven't had any closing statements from Greg. Greg, go ahead, brother. Um, close it on out for us. Well, I was, I was thinking of um, improvisation, just as far as a, on a musical level that uh, to improvise in any style the two things um, that you want to do um, is work on it technically uh, from a technical standpoint as well as um, listening to the, the style of music that you're working on so if you're working on you know playing a great rock guitar solo or a great uh, jazz you know piano solo whatever um, you know, you want to understand um, either from a theoretical uh, standpoint what you're playing, or even you know if you're playing guitar, maybe just the fingering. You know, but you know to know you know what scale works with what. But then at the same time, to also listen a lot, spend a lot of time listening to the particular genre that you're trying to work in. So if you're going to play jazz, you know, because all these styles are like languages basically, and you know. If you want to be a jazz player, listen to a lot of jazz as well as understand it so that you can absorb the language of the phrasing and stuff so that when it does come time to improvise, um, you know, it'll be internal because basically you want to be speaking the language, you know, in the moment that you're playing. 
Great, great, great. Well, great uh, words of wisdom from everybody. Uh, this was a great session, y'all. I think uh, it's going to be very helpful to everybody. So uh, we're going to wrap it up and, um, you know, get ready for the next one. I want y'all to show up. But I want to say one parting thing as well, too. We've been doing this now. They're constantly getting better, more focused, and more improved. So I'm at the point now where I think I'm going to hold a contest because – I have a few things that I'm going to do it, but I've got to name my show. Right. So I think I'm going to hold a contest. So if anybody's got some great names for this show here, uh, go on and su submit, submit them to me. I think I'm going to put up a contest or something on there and just let you guys do it and then work out a real great prize for you. If you think you want to deal with that and uh, get involved, let me know and I'll work something out with you. I need a name. I need a killer name for this show. Don't you all agree? Absolutely. Can't, can't just be Collie Glover's hangout or whatever. Right? We gotta get we gotta get some flesh. So y'all y'all put your thinking caps on for me. I'm gonna be doing it too, but we gotta come up with something cool. All right, y'all. So it's a wonderful session. I had a great time, and uh, you know y'all knocked it out the park as well um, as usual. So I can't wait till we get hit our next one. Okay. So everybody have a right. wonderful day, and I'll catch you guys. Peace. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks Greg. You guys. Yeah, Thanks. Sure. <laughs> okay.